Tonight on It's a Miracle. Lightning strikes. And one woman's life is changed forever. There's a thin line between death and life. I did feel death at the moment of the strike. But she lived. And what happened next would astonish everyone who knew her. A young boy plus an abandoned well equals a tragedy waiting to happen. But something unexpected enters this equation, a miracle of modern technology. When you have kids about this age, you know, you just get... Under constant bombardment from German forces, a young boy finds refuge in the letters from his American pen pal, until six years later when they suddenly stop coming. And I thought to myself, she didn't want to write me in the memoir. And it's, I just left it at that. She never left my mind. I always wondered what she was doing, where she was, if she ever did get married. Still, he never stopped wondering what had happened to her. And 41 years later, he wrote another letter, only to discover that miracles do happen. On this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. There have always been a lot of debate as to whether miracles are real or not. And by their very nature, there will possibly never be an answer. But we've discovered one thing that's always real, the incredible emotions of the people who've experienced miracles in their lives. Tonight, we meet a whole new group of individuals who have agreed to share their personal feelings with us. We begin with a very powerful story. In fact, 20 million volts of power. Betty Galvano has been golfing for over 40 years. It began when she married golf pro Phil Galvano in 1958. She fell in love with his game as well, and it soon gave new meaning to her life. I played golf every day. The day that my first child was born, I hit 3,000 balls. I used to hit balls um, anywhere from 500 to 3,000 a day. I usually outdrove everybody I played with, and I would always win these long drive contests. Eventually, Betty and Phil had six children. All of them played golf. The Galvanos played courses as two foursomes. Five of the six children would grow up to become professional golfers like their father. Betty was an amateur champion. I love the physicalness of it. I love the intelligence of it. The game against yourself of accomplishing, being, you know, seeing the ball go down the fairway, and I love competition. Of competition. Betty? Oh, hi. Hello. How are you? Oh. Ooh. Well, I'm going to live. Some pain. But, but a freak no. fall in July of 1993 put an end to her life on the course. Here we go. Every step I took was excruciating. There you go. Oh. There you go. Boy. Oh. I would sometimes sit up on the edge of the bed or the edge of the chair um, to get up, and I, I would just scream in agony because it, would, it was so painful. There's been some severe damage here. Her hip was badly fractured. Surgeons implanted a steel rod to support the bones while they healed, but gave her little hope of ever walking normally again. You're going to have to get used to not having the same mobility. The doctors said that they had done the best they could for me, that um, I was lucky to even be walking. Can I give you a hand? No, honey, I'm fine. Eleven months after the accident, she could still barely move without the aid of a cane. Oh. Let me get the door for you. Okay, Harry? For a woman who had walked thousands of miles on the world's finest golf courses, the prognosis was particularly grim. Oh, God. I wanted to be the wife I'd always been. I wanted to be the mother I'd always been. I wanted to play golf again. I just wanted to be my old self. 
Betty believed that if her hip was going to recover, she would have to stay active. Sharpen our guy. Oh, on here, let me get that. No, 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 Phil, I got it. So she insisted on doing everything herself, much to her husband's dismay. When my hip bends, gives it exercise, I don't need you to do this for me. All right. I would tell him, don't worry, and I would see him just like, uh, with a different look on his face, like, oh my goodness, I wish you'd let me help. Oh. What? What? It's fast. Where? Where? At times, the pain was unbearable. I just couldn't keep the weight on the painful leg. It's like a sharp oh, knife yeah. running through my leg and radiating okay. up through my hip. Yeah. It's much better. And then, on June 5th, 1994, in a literal bolt out of the blue, lightning struck the Galvano home. All of a sudden, there was just a tremendous clap of thunder. It was like the noise and the lights and the whole house shook. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning burst into the kitchen through the dishwasher and didn't stop until it hit the steel rod in Betty's hip. It had felt like a million trillion needles had entered my foot and gone up my leg to the steel bar. Betty thought she was dying. But there's a thin line between death and life. I did feel death at the moment of the strike. I did sense that. Moments later, something truly miraculous would occur. I'm all right. I'm all right. At that moment when I stood up and realized I wasn't dead, I began to feel, you know, just full of all this joy. And then I was concerned with my leg, and next okay. thing you know, I'm realizing it doesn't have that heavy feeling. Well, there isn't any pain. What are you talking about? The pain is gone. And then... Betty did something she couldn't have dreamed of 10 minutes earlier. I started to walk and then I started to jump and dance. I was just doing all kinds of movements with my leg and uh, we were laughing. Later that day, Betty rushed to visit her friend and physician, Dr. K.K. Yankopoulos, at his home. Hey, hey Dr. Oh, K., hey. come on out How are you guys? We got Hi, something Dr. to show you. K. Show up, please. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> his reaction was the same as all her other doctors. You were struck by lightning? You were struck by lightning? The medical community is not used to using the word miracle. In Betty's case, I, I have no other explanation, nor do any of my colleagues that I've explained this to. The surgeon himself, uh, he didn't know what to think. He just laughed. He wrote it down on the charts, hit by, hit by lightning. That's it, hit by, hit by lightning. On average, lightning kills about 90 people a year worldwide and injures another 300. But for Betty, lightning proved to be a blessing. I just seem to be getting better and better every day. I seem to have more energy every day. In fact, I have more energy now than I had when I was a teenager. Betty still plays several rounds of golf a week. And whether she plays well or not, she always counts herself a winner. Every single day I get up and I count my blessings. It doesn't matter whether it rains or shines, whether I have burnt toast or not any bread at all in the house. I thank God for every single thing. Everything has a different meaning that life is to be lived. No one can explain how something as powerful and deadly as a bolt of lightning could also give new health and life. But Betty has her own explanation. I believe in miracles. I see miracles every day. Hug, hug. <laughs> Everything to me is a miracle, but uh, this is a spectacular miracle. Oh. Definitely, this was a miracle. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> Please stay with us for more incredible miracles right after this. While searching for the stories we present on this show, we've come across several amazing inventions. Inventions without which lives would have been needlessly lost. We call them miracles of modern technology, and we'll be featuring several of them in the weeks to come. 
Our first comes into play in a particularly harrowing yet familiar tragedy. A young child, an innocent curiosity, and a deep abandoned well. On February 15, 1993, two-year-old Javier Gonzalez was playing with his younger cousin in a field near his home in Visalia, California, when the two youngsters became intrigued by what looked like a bucket in the ground. What little Javier didn't know was that the bucket was covering an abandoned well and that it was never meant to hold the weight of a child. As Javier stomped on the rusted out bottom of the bucket, it gave way sending him plummeting into the depths of the well. Luckily, his cousin knew enough to run for help. Minutes later, a 911 emergency call was received by the Visalia Fire Department, where Fireman Dwayne Anthony was on duty that day. We dispatched an engine out, and we were all thinking, okay, well, Kid fell in a hole, nothing big, we're gonna go and pull him out. And then while I'm in route, then it became known that yes, the, the child had fallen in a well. This is one of those that you hope you never have to happen in your lifetime, and we were faced with it. Fireman Mike Sandry was the first to arrive on the scene. Walked over to this well casing, looked down inside it, I heard a child crying, and I could look down at the flashlight and saw there's a, a black head. Uh, about 25 feet down. And the thought came to myself, we got a serious situation right here. With no time to spare, the rescue unit devised a plan. The child was only 25 feet down the well, but they knew it was much deeper. A nearby well was over 100 feet deep. We started requesting more and more equipment. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon, daylight in February, the days are gonna get shorter, it's gonna get colder pretty soon. And we were prepared for the worst. Metal tubing was rushed to the site to pump oxygen through a hose into the well. And a special webbing would be used as a lifeline to the boy. The plan was to lower the webbing into the well and coax the two-year-old to put his hand through the hangman's noose. When it's tightened, they would lift him to safety. But there were concerns. Once we start pulling, is the hanging noose gonna give way and his little hand slip out of it? and fall deeper down into the well. These concerns opened the way for the use of another piece of equipment, a well camera. It was uh, my idea to come up with the well camera because I have an agricultural background and I've seen the well cameras in use. The state-of-the-art video camera is hydraulically lowered into existing wells to search for water levels, rust, and breaks. Today, it would be used to attempt to save a life. Randy Whitman was the owner-operator. My brother and I were on a job location and we got the call from our dispatcher that a kid had fallen in a well in Visalia. I was just hoping that he was alive and that we weren't gonna find uh, a dead child there. As the camera was slowly lowered into the 10-inch wide well casing, everyone waited, not knowing what condition the boy was in. Was the child still caught at the 25-foot level? What was holding him there? And if the camera forced him to move, would he fall deeper down the shaft? These were questions that everyone involved was asking. The conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. While playing near an abandoned well, two-year-old Javier Gonzalez climbed into the metal bucket covering it. And when the rusted bottom caved in, he fell 25 feet underground. Firefighters on the scene quickly devised a plan to save the boy. But the dangerous situation required the use of a special piece of modern technology, a well camera. As the camera was lowered into the well, no one knew for sure what they would find. It was kind of scary. We didn't really know what to expect. We didn't know if, uh, if he was upside down or if he's in water. But when the camera finally reached 25 feet, they could see he was alive and struggling in the well. It was now up to fireman George Sandoval to give the boy instructions in Spanish. 
My concern was that he was going to pick up on my fears. And so just try to tell him that, hey, everything was going to be all right and just kind of relax. Firemen continued to shout instructions down the well to him. They wanted him to move his hands above his head and to see what type of mobility he had. And then we would watch him inside the van on the monitor. But it was impossible to see whether he'd put his hand through the noose or not. For the longest time there, we couldn't tell if it was, if he was just holding on to it with his hand or had he actually put his arm through it. And then a chance movement gave them their answer. For some reason, he happened to raise his arm up. When he raised his arm up above the head, we seen he had the straps tied around his arms, and they were secure on his arm. The decision was made to start pulling him up. With the rescue in its fifth hour, Javier's stamina wasn't holding up. His two-year-old body was slipping in and out of consciousness. When he went into like an unconscious state, is when I gave the order to go ahead and start pulling up because I figured that that was going to be the, the most relaxed he was going to be. Fireman Mike Sandry slowly and cautiously pulled the webbing attached to Javier under the guidance of Randy Whitman. We would come up two feet or so with the camera and stop, and then they would pull him up, and we'd make sure that the strap was still on his arm. That well camera helped me, so if I started pulling too much and started having that hangman's noose or webbing slip off, I would know. So they kind of just guided me in pulling this child out of the well. He kept sliding. I kept assuring him, just stay relaxed. Don't, you know, just stay still. Just relax. And he did. And he continued to come on up. There were just a few feet left to go. With the help of the well camera bringing him up, that eased my stomach and ease the nerves a little bit until the minute I grabbed them, then I knew this incident was over. Got him up, I held him like he was my child, held him tightly, and then I handed him off to the paramedics. It was a big community victory. It was just a big celebration, I guess, if you will. That was probably the best feeling in the world is to know something went right. Because so many times these just don't go right. We have kids about this age, you know, just get. I don't want to. When it was over with, I just started the ball. Because the stress was just so tremendous on me, knowing that this this incident could have gone the other way and Javier wouldn't be with us today. After Javier Gonzalez's miraculous rescue, the camera was sent back down to see what had stopped the boy from plunging deeper into the well. And at 27 feet, they found the answer. An accumulation of debris that had been thrown into the well had saved him from falling an additional 50 feet. We'll be right back. Coming up... A young woman is diagnosed with cancer, and her only hope is a bone marrow transplant. But when her family is tested, the results are not good. No one's a match, so, I mean, they're gonna go to the nationalists to find a stranger to donate it. Hello? At that time, they just told me it was a 24-year-old woman with leukemia, and would I be interested in helping her? Um, yeah, I guess so. Sure. The two strangers would become close friends and change each other's lives in a way that no one could have predicted. Oh my gosh. That's next on It's a Miracle. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. We've presented many stories about guardian angels on this show, but maybe none as moving as the one you're about to see. It's the type of story that restores your trust in human kindness and makes you think twice about what you're doing to make the world a better place.
Rhonda Jensen was only 23 years old and had just started a career as a teacher when she was diagnosed with a deadly form of cancer. You have leukemia. Are you sure? I'm very, very sure. If I saw three tests like this, I would say leukemia, leukemia, leukemia. Overnight, Rhonda was checked into a hospital where she began aggressive chemotherapy. I had never been hospitalized at all up to that point, and I didn't know how long it was going to be or, you know, when or if I was even going to be home again. The cancer went into remission, but a year later it returned. Her only hope for survival was a bone marrow transplant. Bye. Everyone in her close-knit family was tested, but no one was a suitable match. No one's a match, so... I mean, they're going to go to the nationalists to find a stranger to donate it. Luckily, the list contained a potential donor, Ellie Bertrand, a young mother living on a farm in nearby Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Dr. John Odorico explains. It was a perfect match. It was a one in a million match. And uh, because of the closeness of the match, Rhonda had much better chances following a bone marrow transplant from Ellie than from another random stranger. The Red Cross immediately contacted Ellie Bertrand. Hello. At that time, they just told me it was a 24-year-old woman with leukemia. And would I be interested in helping her? Um, yeah, I guess so. Sure. The bone marrow transplant was their only chance for survival. I and can, that's I can all they could really tell me at that time. Six weeks later, in a slow and tedious process, a quart of bone marrow was harvested from Ellie's pelvic bones with a syringe. The bone marrow was then transferred into Rhonda's bloodstream through an IV. If all went well, it would find its way into her bones to replace the diseased bone marrow that had been deliberately destroyed with chemo and radiation. The procedure was a major success, but Rhonda and Ellie were not allowed to meet. You can't know the person that you're donating to for a year. I wanted to know who it was right away and where she was, and, but the only thing I could do was call the Red Cross every three months and get an update on how she was doing. It's up to each the patient and the donor if they want to provide information to one another. So once a year came, I was anxious to see if the donor was, had provided information. And she had. The two women began corresponding regularly. It would be the beginning of a remarkable friendship. Through our letter writing, we kind of figured out that we were basically the same kind of people, small town girls and country background. And it was pretty bizarre. We had a lot of the same interests. Hi. Rhonda. Yeah. I have a surprise for you. Yeah, the first time we met was a total okay. surprise to her because her sister had invited me to her bridal shower. Okay. What? We knew what each other looked like because of uh, pictures. I recognized her right away, but I wasn't expecting her to be there at all. A month later, when Rhonda married her high school sweetheart, Ellie was a special guest. For without her generosity, the marriage might not have ever taken place. Ellie was a born girl, donor. When the pastor introduced her, she received a standing ovation. I don't know, it doesn't seem like what I went through saved her life, but when everyone's coming up to me like, wow, you're Ellie, they kind of sunk in that, you know, I guess what I did did save her life. But four years later, Rhonda's life was once again in grave danger. Her kidneys were failing. Her kidneys were damaged in part due to the chemotherapy, uh, also in part due to the radiation therapy that she received for induction of her bone marrow transplant. We got the test results back, and as we suspected, your kidneys have failed. We have the same By the time the problem was discovered, Rhonda's kidneys were functioning at only 30 percent, and it would only get worse. About three times a week. But what I would like you to consider, and what would give you your best chances, is a kidney transplant. Rhonda met with transplant coordinator Helen Nelson. Do you know if you are blood matched with any of your family members? We tested her mom and her sister to see if they would be potential donors. And after, after we got discussing more her, her history, we inquired if she knew her bone marrow donor. I have to tell you, she would be the perfect donor. 
her blood type had changed. So her immune cells were now of Ellie's type. So it occurred to me that the best match for her would not even be a sister or brother or parent, but would be Ellie. So she's the only one. Rhonda was faced with the difficult task of asking Ellie to save her life well, once more. Could. She's already saved my life once. I can't call her up and, hey, I need you to do it again. I ended up writing a letter and presenting her with what was going on as far as my kidneys went and gave her the phone number of where to go for, for more information. It was pretty shocking when I got the letter. <laughs> I think I knew right away I was going to do it. She had written in there a phone number for a lady in Madison. I got the phone call from Ellie. I couldn't believe it. Hi, Helen. It's Ellie Bertrand. I said, well, Ellie, when did you get the letter? Today. <laughs> Today? Wow, you really jumped right on that. I wanted her to realize that donating a kidney was much more different than donating bone marrow. It was a major surgery. It was a solid organ. It was something that wasn't going to grow back. I said, think about your sons. Think about your husband. If they ever need a kidney, what are you going to do? And her comment was very clear. She said, this is now. She needs it. I want to do this now. I can't what if the future. Come into the office. Um, I'll answer all of your questions that you have. I'm sure you have a lot. And we'll take it from there. OK. Bye-bye. I got home that night, and I just said to my husband, I, I, I don't know if I believe in uh, angels, but I swear, you know, she was in my office today. Good. You feeling OK? Ellie set up an appointment with the Amen. hospital and called Rhonda Good. with the news. Well, I was wondering what you're doing on May 5th. I think I'm free. Yeah, I thought maybe she wanted to go out to eat or meet or something. Um, I mean, I need to check my book, but I think it's OK. OK, why don't you meet me at the hospital? Because I have a kidney I want to give you. Mm. Oh, my gosh. So at that point, she had told me that she'd gone ahead and found a date that would work, and she would be willing to do it. And I was, I was pretty overwhelmed. <laughs> On May 5th, 1999, Ellie and Rhonda kept their date at the hospital. But this time, they were able to face their surgeries together. With this surgery, I was more nervous because I knew it was risky for Ellie, and I wanted to make sure she came, she came through it all all right. The surgery went well. There were no immediate or uh, delayed complications. And Ellie's kidney worked right away in Rhonda. The next day already, I felt totally rejuvenated and energized, and um, it was just amazing, the difference. Not only was the operation a success, it was also a history-making event. I think it's an unprecedented act of human compassion that Ellie chose to be not only a bone marrow donor, but also offer her kidney. OK, why don't you meet me at the hospital? Because I have a kidney I want to give you. Oh, my god. This is a very rare circumstance. And to my knowledge, it's never occurred before. You guys aren't a genetic match, so they're going to go to the national list and find a stranger. And it's just funny that a family member couldn't help, whereas a complete stranger was a better option. That's what I feel the miracle of the whole story would be. You just don't know who you're going to get help from. <laughs> She helps remind us all that there are reasons for being here and helping others and helps you kind of bring back what's important in life. When I look at her and I see her so happy and just doing what everybody else takes for granted makes me feel good that I know I did the right thing and I'm sure I won't ever regret it. Rhonda's health has continued to improve, and she and Ellie remain the best of friends. We've asked him to join us now, along with Rhonda's husband, <laughs> Kevin. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Hi. How Hi. are you doing? Well, Kevin, we've heard from Rhonda and Ellie, and now it's your turn. How has Ellie's remarkable generosity affected your life? Ellie gave someone I really love uh, a gift that uh, I'll be able to spend the rest of my life with her. So. That's pretty, that's a, quite a miracle to me, I guess. And what do you do when Ellie insists that she's done nothing more than any other person would do? She's being way too humble. <laughs> <laughs> There's not too many people in the world like Ellie. Out of a million, she's one. Everybody who knows her or knows what she's done has, has all said the same thing, that she's, 
She's a very unique and wonderful person. <laughs> I certainly agree. Kevin, is there anything you'd like to add? The most, uh, the best thing, the most inspiring thing to me is that there's still people out there in the world that will give everything to help another person, and it just happens to be that person is someone I love very much. And uh, it's a miracle, I think, and God was, uh, God gave us Ellie, and, and Ellie is just, she's pretty special. She's Rhonda's guardian angel, I think. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting all of you, and thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks Bye. for sharing our story. We'll be right back. Coming up next, return to World War II and the German bombing of Britain. It was during those dark days that a young English boy began corresponding with a young American girl. Their letters would continue for six years until after he joined the Royal Navy. I did write to say that I was arriving in the US and would it be all right if I'd come out to meet her, but I never did get a reply to it. And then, 41 years later, he received an unexpected letter. When It's a Miracle continues. If you don't believe that love is one of the most powerful of all human emotions, our next story may change your mind. It's a romance that begins during the dark days of World War II between two people who have never met and who will remain an ocean apart for the next 50 years. And still, love miraculously survives. It was 1942, and England was under constant bombardment from German forces. Buildings crumbled, fires raged, and devastation was everywhere. Geoffrey Lake was 14 years old. We never slept in our beds. We had to go down to the, what we call, air raid shelters. We could hear the nose cone of the shell coming to the earth. Many a time I thought to myself, God, I wish I could get out of this. But Jeffrey's only escape from the horrors of war was through the letters he received from his American pen pal, Colleen Lee. Dear Jeff, it's a wonderful day. The trees in the park are splendid today. The clouds high above me remind me of a poem you once sent to me. Colleen was also 14, but her life in the small town of Soldier, Iowa, was worlds away from Jeffrey's fearful existence. I sit here enveloped by the beauty of the afternoon, and I send you a greeting. She explained what the town was like, the things she used to do for pastimes, like going to the movies, dancing with her friends. I hope that you are well. Please write soon and let me know how you are. Best wishes, Colleen. Jeff and Colleen continued writing to each other for the next six years. By then, Jeff had joined the Royal Navy to aid in the war effort and continued their correspondence as he moved from port to port. Dear Colleen, I've been in Her Majesty's Royal Navy for six months now. I did write to say that I was arriving in two different ports in the US and that I got some leave and would it be all right if I'd come out to meet her? Hope to hear from you soon. Your friend, Jeff. But I never did get a reply to it. Six years after first writing to each other, Colleen's letters stopped coming. Finally, didn't get no more letters from Colleen. I thought myself, she didn't want to write me in the memoir. And it's, I just left it at that. Jeff returned to England after his tour of duty. And in 1952, he married. But over the years, he continued to wonder about Colleen. She never left my mind. I always wondered what she was doing, where she was, if she ever did get married. 41 years later, in 1989, Jeff finally decided to make a move to satisfy his curiosity. 
he was determined to find out what happened to the girl he'd written to so many years before. It's just a pulse at that moment that I went right to her. But all I could remember that she lived in the town of Soldier in the state of Iowa. I could not remember the rest of her address. Jeff decided he would send a letter to the mayor of Soldier on the remote chance that he would know Colleen and pass the letter on. A month later, Jeff received an unexpected surprise. When I did see the letter, it was from Colleen. And I thought, great. I'm through the bits, you know, I've got a letter from Colleen. Her reply would change both of their lives forever. The conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. During the English Blitz of World War II, 14-year-old Jeffrey Lake dreamed of a better life and found it in letters from his American pen pal, Colleen Lee. The two corresponded for the next six years, and then suddenly her letters stopped arriving and Jeffrey moved on with his life. But he never forgot the young girl he'd grown so attached to. And so, 41 years later, to satisfy his curiosity, he wrote her another letter, and she replied. Dear Jeff, a lot has happened since we last corresponded. In the letter, I mentioned that the reason I quit writing was because I was going to get married, and my fiancé wasn't too happy with me writing to him anymore. And then when I got the letter, I was very surprised, and, and I asked my husband then if it was OK to write back to him and let him know what we've been doing. The two soon began corresponding again on a regular basis. I would write to Jeffrey and sign my letters, Colleen and Harvey, and then uh, Jeffrey would sign his, Jeff and Eileen. And our uh, spouses both read our letters, and they were very interested in our correspondence, too. The old pen pal's new correspondence continued happily for the next three years. Then, in December of 1992, Jeff received some tragic news. I received this dreadful letter from Colleen explaining to me that she had lost her husband through cancer. I did send a sympathy card to Colleen from myself and my wife. Every anniversary of Harvey's death, uh, they would send uh, me a sympathy card in remembrance of Harvey and I always thought that was special to receive. Five years later, Jeff would experience a similar tragedy. Jeffrey wrote that his wife had passed away suddenly, and I was devastated. I knew what he was going through. Now it was Colleen's turn to send a sympathy card. I was left in the house on my own, and I was really depressed. A month later, in January of 1998, Jeff, feeling low, phoned Colleen for the very first time. Hello. And he said, hello, Colleen. Do you know who this is? Jeff? How did you know it was me? Well, I don't know anyone else who would have an English accent. What a lovely surprise. It did ease my feelings tremendously when I heard Colleen's voice. And that's the first time either of us had heard each other's voices after all them years. We had a really nice conversation, and he was saying how, how lonely he was. It's still very difficult for me sometimes, too. And then I asked her that I'd like to come to America to meet her. He said, would the end of May be good? And I said, uh, Jeff, I have some family coming and some friends this month. I was finding excuses for him not to come because I thought it was a little soon after him losing his wife. When I finished the conversation, I said to her, I'll talk to you soon, love. Well, back in England, that's an everyday greeting. But to Colin, that was something very, very different. No one had ever said that to me before. Oh, bye. And uh, it just 
melted my heart. After that, the two corresponded more frequently. They spoke over the phone at least twice a week, and the friendship soon blossomed into romance. Finally, as the romance grew, Colleen gave in. Hello? Colleen phoned back to me Hi. saying, at the end of May, Hi. it'll be a good time to come. And then I started making arrangements to, to come to America. They arranged to meet in New York at JFK Airport. Their planes were scheduled to arrive around the same time. I was anxious, excited to think I was going to meet her. But to Jeff's surprise, Colleen was nowhere in sight. I thought to myself, she stood me up. And I thought to myself, what a place to be stood up at. And I didn't know what to do, so I was persistent. I stood there. Jeff stood by the arrival gates for more than three hours. And then, finally, his persistence paid off. I spotted him right away, and he saw me. It was a wonderful feeling to see him for the first time. Big smile, and big brown eyes. Colleen. Jeff. <laughs> Colleen's flight had been canceled at the last minute, causing her delay. But it didn't matter to either of them at that magical moment. There's electric sparks through everywhere. It was meant to be, and it was love at first sight. After spending time in New York, Jeff went home with Colleen and ended up staying for a month. By the time they finally parted, the two had decided to spend the rest of their lives together. After 56 years, the happy couple finally married on November 28, 1998. From the very first time when we started writing as teenagers, and through all the years, up until now, it just seems like it was meant to be. Someone upstairs must have been watching over us and knew that we should be together. So to us, it seems like a miracle. Today, Jeffrey and Colleen Lake live in Soldier, Iowa, and Jeffrey is working toward becoming an American citizen. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. Good night.